Om Namo Arunachaleswaramanaya Namaha. Namaskaram and good evening to our brothers and sisters in Bhagawan. A set of questions from our devotees has been forwarded to David. And David will answer the questions as part of this session. Two more or three questions may be we'll taken from the seekers in the session later. It depends on our timing. We hope the session will be an enlightening one with David. And kindly mute all the mic. Welcome to our satsang, David. Namaste. And the session is all yours. Well, f first of all, th thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming along to listen to what I have to say about Bhagavan and related matters. I have a list of questions which was submitted a while ago. I will, I picked some out. Uh, the first one interests me a little bit, so I might spend more time on that. And then after, after that, there's a few more. And if we have time at the end, then uh, feel free to ask supplementary questions. So the question is, in the practice of self-inquiry, the journey from the individual eye to the substratum or self is fraught with our mental conditioning or vastness for most of us. It would help us immensely if you could share what obstacles you encountered, if any, and how did you deal with them? Um, before I get to the personal, I want to give some general comments on vastness, uh, how they work, what they are, how they obscure our true nature. Um, not, not everybody will be familiar with this idea, so I'll just give a few, uh, some background information. Vasanas are the hidden latent desires or tendencies that jump up and take our interest and attention away from ourselves and make it instead put it on the things or ideas or flights and fancy. Um, you say in part of the question that most of us are afflicted by them. I think it's fair to say all of us, not just most of us. Vasanas are what stop us all from being aware of the self, of who we really are. If we are not realized, then it's safe to say that it's because we have bassinus, mental addictions that are compelling us to put our attention on something that's not the self. Um, in, in recent times, I've been explaining bassinus in an interesting new way because I had little insight that uh, I think explains them quite well. Um, our, our vasanas are actually the mind's equivalent of the YouTube sidebar. So please indulge me on this while I explain. Uh, YouTube, YouTube stores all your past playing habits. It knows what interests you, what will make you press play on the next video. All of those desired visit videos and topics, they all end up on your sidebar and they help you to waste hours of your day. In your Sidebar, there might be movies about your favorite sports team, there might be cat videos, there might be recipes, there might be gossip about movie stars. Whatever appears there, it reflects your known past interests and it makes you press a button and start watching. YouTube really does know your mind and what makes it excited because it's kept a permanent record of everything you've ever viewed on its channel. So the mind's vasana sidebar works in much the same way because it knows what's interested you in the past. It knows what to put in front of you to distract you the best. The things that have grabbed your attention before will keep coming up again and again. They might be desires, they might be aversions, they might be fears. Anything in fact that has any kind of emotional charge for you is likely to come up in this mental sidebar. If there's an attraction or an aversion, these things will come up. The mind sidebar knows what will get you distracted. It keeps putting these things in front of you again and again. So each time you run after a thought, a vasana, and get excited by it, it allows that thought to run away, to connect to another one. The mind takes note and it says, aha, this topic uh, keeps his or her attention away from the self. I'll store this one, I'll use this one next time. I want to distract him. The vasanas, are, the vasanas that are the most compelling are the ones that the mind repeatedly puts in front of you because it knows from past experience that these are the ones that would distract you the most. So this is the mind's vasana sidebar. What to do with it, how to 
counter this program that's installed in your brain, all your likes, dislikes, your fears, your aversions. The first thing I will say in order to make some headway against your fastener sidebar is you need a little biragia, a little discrimination. Um, let me give you another analogy on this one. All, all of these distracting thoughts and fasteners, they're a bit like a traveling salesman who comes to your door to sell you stuff you don't want and don't need. So ima imagine you're sitting in your house in a room and from your vantage point, you can see your front door and a window that's next to it. You see a man who looks like a salesman walking past your outside window, heading to your front door. You know he's going to come to your front door, knock, and then try and waste your time and your attention by persuading you to buy some new item that you don't really want. As you sense him coming closer and closer to the door, learn to say to yourself, not to him, say it to yourself, not today, thank you, I'm not going there. As soon as you become aware he's about to tempt you with something, reject that thought. Don't even go to the front door to tell him you're not interested. Just refuse to engage with him. This, this is discrimination, this is bairagia. When you see distantly the vastness starting to come towards you, inviting you, run after me, run after me, just tell yourself, you're all coming to disturb my peace. You want to make me excited about something that's not my own self. I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to enjoy my own inner silence. This is how you deflate the emotional energy that makes the fasteners so compelling, so compulsive. Each time you say no thank you to a rising thought, a fastener, it loses a little of its power. If you keep saying no thank you, not today thank you, every time they come, visit you, come to visit you and try to get you excited, this fastener, this thought begins to realize it's losing its hold over you and eventually it stops banging on your door and demanding your attention and interest. You also need to recognize that the menu of things that the mind is offering you, offering you moment to moment as entertainment and distraction is not a wholesome diet. It's the mental equivalent of junk food. The mind wants you to binge on it. And if you give into it, you just get mental indigestion. Re recognize that what you are being offered by the never ending parade of tempting fasteners is unwholesome food and that by indulging in them endlessly, you just end up suffering and in distress. You have to learn to avoid the suffering that comes from a lack of discrimination by exercising discrimination and better judgment. So let, let me give you another example. If you're a diabetic who knows that eating sweet food puts you in a diabetic coma, you avoid sweets and sugar in general. If you are a discriminating diabetic, you can stand outside a cake shop and see and smell the goodies inside. You may salivate, but you don't go in and eat the cakes because you know that if you do, you'll end up in a diabetic coma. Have the same kind of discrimination with the thoughts and vastness that come your way. Recognize that indulging in them will not do you any good and avoid following them as much as possible. Um, about 35 years ago, in the 1980s, I was sitting with an Amle Swami in German Amle, and he gave me a really good rural, rural analogy for how vasanas work. He said they're like uh, domesticated chickens that scratch on the concrete floor of an indoor hen house. Now, now scratching is the natural habit of chickens when they're on open ground, that's how they find their insect food. But if you put them in a confined space on a concrete floor, they will still scratch because the ingrained habit is so strong, that's what chickens do. They'll carry on doing it even when their feet bleed because that's what they're programmed to do. And we're all similarly programmed. We, we are programmed to run after thoughts and desires no matter how much suffering they cause us. And even though they cause us unwanted suffering, we feel we can't stop doing it and just end up getting into more and more suffering. Following our vasanas compulsively is just like the chickens scratching on the concrete floor. There is no useful healthy food to be had by following them, but by compulsively doing it, we just end up getting injured. Um, I also spent time with Papaji and other of Bhagavan's great devotees, he had another interesting passionate analogy. He said, imagine you're sitting by the side of the road watching the cars drive past. They're not your business, they don't bother you. 
So you just let them drive by. But if you grab hold of one of the bumpers of the car, you get dragged along and injured. He said, that is stupid enough in itself, but you don't learn your lesson from doing it. You then grab the next bumper, you get dragged along and you get injured again. He said, this is how the fasteners work. They're just thoughts floating by, but then you get excited by them, you try and grab hold of them, and they take you on a bumpy ride again and again. His advice, and I suspect Bhagavan's advice, would be let the passing thoughts be there. They're not our business. Don't try to claim them, own them, run after them, or take rides on them. If you do, you end up suffering. Um, now I think I'll head back to Bhagavan and give a little advice from Bhagavan himself on um, how he suggested dealing with the Vasanas. He said that um, if you think you're a person inside a body, and that's pretty much all of us, your vasanas will run your life. But he also said, don't think that you're a bad or an unspiritual person when you become aware of this. Don't feel guilty about the state of your mind or your inability to do anything about it. Um, we all think we're terrible people. We, we, we seem to be the only people who have access to the inner workings of our mind and we all think they're in a mess and we all think we are the worst person in the world. I think Bhagavan said, don't feel like this. This is how minds work. Everybody suffers in this way. In the text, Who Am I? Bhagavan wrote, don't fall into the trap of thinking I'm a bad person or I'm a sinner just because your vasanas appear to be out of control. That's everybody's story. It's the normal state of all people who have minds and who let their minds run their lives for them. He said when thoughts of unworthiness or lack of progress come along, Instead of indulging them or wallowing them or feeling guilty about them, put attention on the one who's having them. Who thinks he or she is a bad person? Whose mind seems to be out of control? He said there's a simple solution to these feelings of unworthiness, these feelings that your mind is out of control. Instead of feeling bad about them, just withdraw attention and say, who is having these bad feelings? Who is having this busy mind? So instead of beating oneself up for not being able to control one's mind or vastness, Bhagavan advises us just to take attention off that feeling of inadequacy and guilt and instead put it on the eye that is having and experiencing that feeling. Next, and this is quite important, Bhagavan says don't try to force the mind to behave. He said don't put it in a straitjacket, that never works. He said don't try to suppress desires or vastness, that's not his way. Um, Bhagavan's way, as he explained on several occasions, is to offer the mind something that is more pleasant and more peaceful than the enjoyment it experiences by wandering around and following its fasteners. Bhagavan had a very um, appropriate analogy for the different approaches of suppression, which he said was the yogic way, and self-inquiry, which was his way, which doesn't aim to suppress thoughts or vasanas. The analogy he used was that of a bull that's wandering around out of control. You imagine you said that you have a bull and that you keep it in your stable. If you leave the door open, the bull will wander out looking for food. It may find food, but a lot of the time it would just get into trouble by grazing in other people's fields. Um, the, the owners of those fields will beat it with sticks. They'll throw stones at it to chase it away but it will return to the same places again and again and suffer repeatedly because it doesn't understand the basic notion of field boundaries. It's just programmed to look for food and to eat it wherever it finds something interesting or edible. Now the bull in Bhagavan's analogy is the mind, the stable is the heart where it arises and to where it returns, and the grazing in the fields represents the mind's painful addiction to seeking pleasure in outside objects by following its fasteners. Uh, Bhagavan said that most mind control techniques forcibly restrain the ball, the mind, to stop it moving around, but they don't do anything about the ball's fundamental desire to wander and get itself into trouble. You can tie a ball or try to lock it in its stable, but it won't like it you will just end up with an angry bull that will probably be looking for a chance to commit some act of violence on you. You don't end its tendency to wander and forage by doing this. So Bhagavan likened self-inquiry, the alternative to suppression, to holding a bunch of fresh, fresh grass under the bull's nose. 
your ball is out, causing trouble, you go up to it. And instead of trying to catch it or tie it up or suppress it in some way, he said, hold out uh, a bunch of fresh grass under its nose. As the ball approaches it, you move back towards the direction of the stable door and the ball will follow you. Le lead it back into its stable and it will voluntarily follow you because it wants the pleasure of eating the grass that you are holding out in front of it. And then once it's in the stable, you allow it to eat the large supply of grass that's always stored there. The, the door of the stable is always open, left open, and the ball is free to leave and roam around any time it wants to. There's no punishment and no restraint. The ball mind will go out repeatedly because it's the nature of such animals to wander in search of food. And when it does, it repeatedly suffers. Every time you notice that your ball, your mind has wandered out, tempt it back into its stable, which is the heart, with the same technique. Don't try to beat it into submission or you may be attacked yourself. And don't try to solve the problem by forcibly locking it up. Sooner or later, even the most uh, unintelligent of bulls will understand that since there is a perpetual supply of tasty food in the stable, there is no point wandering around outside because those wanderings always lead to sufferings and punishments. So e even though the stable door is always open, the bull will eventually stay inside and enjoy the food that's always there. This is how self-inquiry works. The grass you are offering and the grass inside the stable is the pleasant nourishment you get from being aware of the eye and remaining absorbed in it. So this is the, the carrot instead of the stick. The grass that you take the, the eye back to the stable with is something that the, enjoy, the eye enjoys. You put it under the nose of the eye, you take the eye back to its source, and when it gets there, it has the abundant piece of the self. Keep doing that and sooner or later the eye will recognize that there's more peace to be had inside than there is outside, what wandering around and suffering in the world. So whenever the mind compelled by its fastness, what wanders around outside in search of external objects and sense perceptions, very gently take it back to its stable, the heart, the source from which it rises and to which it returns. Don't force it, just make it be aware it's better off at home. In that place, it can enjoy the peace and bliss of the self. Eventually, even though you keep the stable door open all the time, the mind will choose to stay at home and wander about because it's got the happiness of being inside. It, it recognizes the peace that's inside and is no longer tempted by what's on the outside. So in this long, rather elaborate analogy, Bhagavan never explained it as long as I just did, but I like the story, so I've extrapolated on it a little. Bhagavan said that the way of restraint was the way of the yogi. The, the yogis tried to achieve restraint by forcing the mind to be still. Um, Self-inquiry, Bhagavan system, gives the mind the option of wandering wherever it wants to, and it achieves its success uh, by gently persuading the mind it will always be happier by staying at home. So this is a, a rather long story, but the bottom line is that the forcible restraint of vasanas does not work. You have to give the mind something better to enjoy, something it will prefer to eat instead of worldly pleasures. Bhagavan said that by repeatedly ignoring the vastness of the mind and instead going back to the peace of the self within through inquiry, what one finally comes to realize that this peace is more satisfying than the suffering that comes from indulging in vastness. I digressed a lot in this answer and ignored what uh, was probably the main, the main part of the question, which was, um, it would help us immensely if you could share what obstacles you yourself encountered, if any, and how did you deal with them? Um, when I started doing self-inquiry long, long ago, I was a very young, energetic sadhu type who thought I could get enlightened very quickly by meditating all day. I, I thought it was all, all within my power, all, all within my ability through hard work, through concentration, through focus. I thought I could solve this problem myself by my own efforts. I could pull my mind away from the thoughts and push it back to the self. Since then, I, I've adopted a far more relaxed attitude. And I think the major change for me is that I've learned that, how shall we say, Bhagavan is on my side. I'm not fighting a battle by myself to subdue my mind. Nowadays, when I look inside myself, 
I recognize that Bhagavan is there inside me, smiling back at me, um, silently encouraging me to come home. I, I have learned to recognize that he's helping me moment to moment, uh, encouraging me to look and move in the right direction. So in, instead of fighting thoughts and vasanas, I've, I've learned to be aware of the presence of Bhagavan inside me, to hand over and surrender my thoughts and vasanas to him and tell him that the, these, are, these are yours, you look after them. Um, I, I no longer consider it's my, my job to do this. I've, I've subcontracted the job to Bhagavan and personally I think he's the best sub, subcontractor and he's going to do a much better job than I can. So nowadays when I sit and I meditate and I do inquiry, which I still do, I, I do it with an awareness of Bhagavan's smiling face beside me or inside me, silently encouraging me. And if, it, if you want another analogy, it's a bit like having your mum or your dad sit next to you while you're doing some really hard homework. When you, when you go wrong or you lose attentiveness, then the parent gives you a little nudge and helps you and puts you back on the right path. So I, I've learned, um, so that, that's Bhagavan on the inside. I've also learned from direct experience that if you have the good fortune to sit with someone whose mind is dead, and Yani, so, someone whose own vastness have been extinguished, then being in their presence is an immense help to quietening one's own mind and its chaotic fasteners. I know this is not an option for everyone, but if you do have the good fortune to meet someone who can put you in that state of quiet and keep you there, then spend as much time in their presence as possible. In that situation, you are freewheeling downhill on your bike instead of pedaling uphill into a headwind. That was a, a long answer to question one. Uh, question two says, in one of your YouTube videos, you have so perceptively mentioned the possible folly of turning the eye into an object while practicing self-inquiry when we should be sensing the subject, the being. You have suggested how it is better to ask who is doing the cognizing or perceiving, etc., for us. Is it possible to make some additional suggestions or elaborations? This is from Parvida Kaur. Thank you for the question. Good question. I like it. Um, additional hints. The mind is programmed to find things by looking for them as objects separate from itself. Uh, if, if I say, where is my key? Help me to find it. There's an immediate extroversion of the mind as it seeks an object outside of itself, outside of the body it appears to live in. That this is a very uh, efficient way of looking for a key, but a terrible way of looking for the eye, because wherever the eye looks for itself, it invariably ends up fixating on something that's not the eye. It might be a feeling of peace, it might be an absence of thoughts, it might be a place in the body or a sensation. Whatever it is, it is something that the eye is aware of, not the eye itself. So how do you avoid falling into this trap? Um, the best suggestion I know is to be aware of the eye while it is searching and not after it's found something and proclaimed, this is my eye. Remember the eye that is doing the looking is the eye that you need to keep attention on. Uh, I'll repeat that sentence because it's a very important one. I think a lot of people don't get this. The eye that is doing the looking is the eye that you need to keep your attention on. Whatever it finds is not the eye. Whatever it finds is just another object in its field of attention. So if, if you go back to the, the, key in that, the key story again, the eye is the one wandering around the room looking for the missing object. The eye is the one searching. It's not the thing it eventually finds under a cushion at the end of the search. The, the, the eye is the one who's looking. The eye is never the thing that's found. So as you do inquiry, don't look for an eye in a place or a state or an experience. Just be aware of the process of looking. Watch yourself doing the looking. The eye is actually the thing that is doing the looking. It's not the thing that you're looking for. Tr try to be aware of that. And most importantly, don't be satisfied with anything that you find. As the eye searches, be aware of this searching eye and reject all the, the shiny objects of attention it comes up with. 
They might be nice, peaceful, blissful states, but they're not the I. The, the basic rule of thumb is if you can be aware of them, they're not the I. They're just experiences that the I is enjoying or, ex or experiencing. Um, I, I bracketed questions three and four together because I, I think parts of the answer they, they will share in common, so I, I'll answer them together. Um, question three said, uh, generally, we all have desires. We understand that the only valid desire is to do at Mivichara. However, during practice, we may slip from the goal. How should we manage the desires and what type of desires are wrong? This is from Shamagam. And the next question is, in your opinion, how does one juggle between work and spiritual practice, especially when issues at work take so much space in one's life, dampening our spiritual journey? Um, th this is, these are two questions um, that are on the minds of a lot of people, particularly householders, how to juggle the work, life, spiritual practice balance. Um, most of us have destinies that necessitate us being productive in the world. We don't have the luxury of not working and being able to meditate all day without interruption. Uh, we mostly have jobs to do, families to look after, and so on. A desire to keep your family healthy, safe, and well provided for is a legitimate desire and one that should never be avoided. Um, Bhagavan repeatedly told devotees, don't shirk from any of the duties and responsibilities that have been given to you in this life. But at the same time, he also asked us to be aware of what our minds are doing moment to moment. Um, he said, while you are working, try to be aware that you're not the doer of the activities you're undertaking. And in your free time, look inside yourself and try to be aware of the source of the eye that jumps up and says, I, I live in this body. That fundamental assumption is the cause of all problems, he says, and it needs to be challenged as often as possible. So this is, this is what Bhagavan himself taught. Um, and even though he taught that one should try to be aware of the self while one is working, I will be the first to admit it's a really, really hard thing to accomplish. I've talked to innumerable old devotees of Bhagavan, people who had the opportunity to sit with him, live with him, and they all told me it was next to impossible to do this. So although uh, I will say this was Bhagavan's advice, um, I will also say don't be upset if you can't carry it out, virtually nobody can. So when I, when I talk about this, I normally tell the story of Anamale Swami in his working career at Ramanashram because it's, it's a really good illustration of this. He arrived in uh, 1928 and for the next 10 years or so, Bhagavan kept him incredibly busy supervising building projects at Ramanashram. He said, I, I never managed to sit down in those 10 years. If, if Bhagavan ever saw me not working, he'd just invent a job to keep me busy. And they were always building jobs. They were always jobs I had to think a lot. I had people to supervise. I had materials to buy, store, look after. So my head was always full of uh, building thoughts. And he said, I once walked into the hall in the evening. The evening was the only time that ashram workers were allowed to sit with Bhagavan. Uh, during the day, they had to be doing their allocated duties. So in the evening, he walked into the hall. Everybody was sitting very quietly, very quietly, very peacefully. And Bhagavan immediately looked at him and started talking about buildings. And one of the meditators more or less said, you know, can't you keep this building stuff out of the hall? We, we, we're, we're sitting here being quiet, minding our own business. And Bhagavan said, I couldn't help it. He, he walked in here and his head was so full of building thoughts that automatically I had to talk about buildings because his head was so full of thoughts. So Anamale Swami had 10 years of constant association with Bhagavan. He had private one-on-one -on -one time with him every day. Um, they did personal tours of the buildings after lunch every day. And throughout those 10 years, Bhagavan was saying, be aware that you're the self at all times. Just keep repeating to yourself, I am the self, I'm not the body. And Anamle Swami said, I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It's only after he let me, he released me from my work at the ashram and let me meditate in Palakotu. When I sat down, it came very easily, very quickly. 
I think all of those years of satsang with Bhagavan had prepared the ground, if you way, if you like. And when I went off to meditate, I found it a lot easier to do. So I tell people that here is a man who for 10 years had very intimate association with Bhagavan. Bhagavan told him to be aware of the self at all times. And even, even though he had that strong daily association, he found it very, very difficult. And when he walked into Bhagavan's presence, he still had a head full of building thoughts and he couldn't help it. So when people tell me they can't um, do this very well, I say, well, my sympathy is that very, very few people can. And even some of the better devotees who lived at Ramaneshram in Bhagavan's lifetime, they couldn't do it, e even though he repeatedly tried to get them to do it. So then we move to plan B. If you can't manage to keep your attention on the self during working hours or when your mind is needed for other responsibilities, at least don't waste your spare time. This is what um, Bhagavan told to Siva Prakas and Pillai. He said, cultivate silence in your spare time and let that silence be the undercurrent to your everyday life. Um, in, in your spare time, look for the source of your mind, look for the eye, go back to the peace that is inherent within you, find that peace, establish that silence in your spare time when you're not bothered by your work or your family or all the things that your intellect has to do, do during working hours. Then when you've got this silence inside you from your spare time, you can walk into your living room and if there's a big family fight going on, you, you, you can function from the zone of silence that you've created in your spare time. It, it's like having uh, money in your silence bank. You, you make the payments during the quiet times, you store it up when the mind is not needed. And then when you're at work in a, a stressful situation, you may find that you can use your store of silence of peace that you have as a credit in your silence account to navigate all the ego fights that are going on around you. Uh, these will be the background to your daily life. So if you, if you can work during the self, if you can work and be aware of the self, fine. In my experience, virtually nobody can. So pl plan B, says Bhagavan, is not to waste your spare time. Whenever your mind is not needed for your duties, your family, your business, try and put it back into the self. And then when you do have to do your job or look after your family, there's an undercurrent of silence that seeps out into those everyday activities. The fifth question is, um, what is your advice to a spiritual seeker based on Bhagavan's teachings? This is from Murugaya, Secretary of the Society. Um, I would say, have, have faith that he's on your side. Um, have faith that Bhagavan is looking after you and that he has your best interests at heart. He has given you a very effective teaching that will bring you home if you have full faith in those teachings, full faith in him, and if you try to put those teachings into practice. Um, that, that There's a story that I like, it's not about Bhagavan, but it's a good illustration of what I'm trying to say in this final answer, and it comes from the Sagadatta Maharaj. Now he didn't, he wasn't enlightened when his guru died. His guru said, you are, you are Brahman. And he died without realizing Brahman. And for the next two or three years, he just was wondering, why did my guru give me this phrase, this Upadesha, you are Brahman? What does it mean? What am I supposed to do with this? He said, I was, I was thinking about it quite a lot. Um, not trying to establish my identity with Brahman. I, I was more wondering, why did he tell me this? Why, why did my guru tell me this? What was the purpose of giving me these three words? And then he said, one day, um, the thought just arose in my mind. Why would my guru tell me anything that wasn't true? This must be truth. This must be true. This must be truth itself. And he said, the moment I had absolute faith that my guru was telling me the truth, I became the truth. He said, in that moment, you are Brahman was, was no longer a piece of information that he'd given to me. He said, I became that Brahman and I stayed in that state ever since. So, so really, it can be that simple. Um, you're asking, what is your advice to a seeker on Bhagavan's teachings? Just believe that Bhagavan is telling you the truth about who you are. If your faith is strong, if you can hear his words with an utterly silent mind, 
um, you may suddenly discover the truth of them for yourself. But if you're not one of the lucky or mature ones and the words don't do their work immediately, have absolute faith instead that his practical teachings will work. And if you make an effort to put them into practice, um, you, you're, you're, you're probably going to succeed. He's not like a vindictive driving test examiner who's looking for the slightest error, the, the smallest mistake in order to fail you. He's, he's on your side, he's encouraging you. He actually wants you to succeed. He is tolerant of your waywardness. He will always welcome you back if you run away into the world of thoughts and desires and then return to him. He is endlessly forgiving, always seeing the good in you, always radiating the grace that you can experience for yourself simply by looking in his direction, either by focusing on his form or looking for him in the form of the self. So my advice is just believe that he's there to help you and the help will flow in your direction. Just get out of the way and allow him to pull you into himself and leave the rest to him. Uh, I, I think it was Arthur Osborne who received, or maybe he just recorded the marvellous Upadesha from Bhagavan. Just keep quiet and Bhagavan will do the rest. So with that, I, 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 I will conclude. If any, anybody has any supplementary questions or follow-up, I'm happy to address them. Yes, David, I think Dr. Lim would like to present a question to you. Indeed, I think he has spoken to you some years back when, I don't know whether he had met you in Thirunamale or over the phone. Dr. Lim, Hi. are you there? Hi. Thanks, Dave. Hi. Hi, David. Nice to see you. Yeah, I have spoken to you on a few occasions in the past. Ah. Uh, Today, I would like to ask you something about the Ahams Purana. Uh, Bhagwan has spoken about the Ahams Purana in uh, Upadisa Saram verses 1920, in uh, Uladu Par uh, Narpadu verses mm. number 30. And basically, the three verses say that when one inquires within, who am I? The eye subsides as soon as one reaches the heart. And reality spontaneously manifests as I, I. So my question is this. If one does self-inquiry, but is not able to have a clear perception of the Ahams Purana, what could be the reasons? Is it because the effort is weak and uh, is insufficient to make the mind uh, abide at the source? Or is it because there are also other important factors at play besides our human effort? Things like karmic forces, vasanas, operation of grace, etc. Can you shed some light on this? That's, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, when Bhagavan spoke about the Ahams Purana, I think, although he tended to talk indirectly in the third person, I think a lot of the time he was talking about himself and the experience he himself had in 1896 in Majurai, where he, he most definitely did have this experience of the Ahams Purana. Um, but he never said that this was necessary for other people. Um, he, he seemed to accept that you could get uh, direct experience of the self, a permanent eradication of individual identity without going through this um, final intermediate stage of Ahams Purana, which he said was a kind of ni neither mind nor self, but a kind of intermediate state in which I is somehow dualistically experiencing waves of the self without being self itself. If, if you recollect on, on his own realization day, it all started by an intense fear of death. Um, he felt he was going to die. Instead of going off to see a doctor or running away from that fear, he, he completely allowed himself to be taken over it. Now, my feeling is that when the eye gets close to the self, the eye recognize it, recognizes its imminent destruction and it runs away, it jumps out, it, it gets fear, it gets panic, it jumps up and it goes away. I think Bhagavan was one of those very rare cases in which this natural instinctive jumping, jumping away from imminent destruction didn't happen. He, he was mature enough 
to watch the process of his own I dissolve and vanish into the self. And I think that's a very, very rare thing for to happen with anyone. I think our I does occasionally get close to the self, uh, but it's accumulation of fasteners, it's karma, whatever, never quite gets it close enough. And if it does get close, it starts to have a little bit of a panic. So it creates some entertainment, some extroverting tendencies, so it goes back to enjoy the world again. That, that's what I was speaking of in answer to the first question. So I think there has to be an absolute readiness for the attenuated eye to subside into the self and disappear. I think for the, the self or the guru to pull the attenuated eye back into the self and destroy it, that eye has to have no interest or capacity of extroverting or engaging with the world anymore. It has to have reached a point through its own efforts or through grace that it's in a state of quiescence, that it's not reaching out to grab onto anything. It has no desire for external entertainment anymore. If there is any kind of extroverting tendency, then it's not going to go back into the self and disappear. Bhagavan has said that the self only has the capacity to pull an eye into itself and completely destroy it if its extroverting energy has gone. And that extroverting energy is the vasanas. It's the accumulation of all the energy that makes the mind go outwards instead of inwards. So why doesn't it happen with a lot of people? The answer is the vasanas haven't been reduced or attenuated to a point where the self has the power or capacity to pull the residual eye into itself and destroy it. Thanks so much. It's very clear. Is there any more questions from anyone? Yeah, I have a, a question, um, hand speaking. Yes, uh, uh, can, uh, can I force this readiness? Uh, I think I'm ready, but my behavior is uh, differently. Um, is that the question? Yeah, how can I uh, become really ready? I don't think that any of us, if we live in a mind and function through a sense of individuality, we have no capacity to judge our own readiness. Uh, th th this is our problem. We, we may all think that we want this to happen. We may all think we're ready for it, but I don't, I don't think we are. We, we can't see all the, all the layers, all the problems, all, all the accumulation of stuff that's below our conscious level. Um, we don't know how close we are. And so long as you have a mind, you have no capacity to say, it's next week, next year, next lifetime, or 10 lifetimes. There's something about having a mind that disqualifies you from judging how mature it is or how close it is to destruction. Okay. Hans? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. It's just uh, always keeping up practice until it's, uh, yeah. It's ready. It, it, it's not your job to ascertain your progress or to judge how close or how far you are away. You, your job, if you're following Bhagavan's teachings, is to hold on to the eye or surrender it. And the consequences of that, you should surrender to him. It's, yeah. not, it's not your business to speculate. And even if you do speculate, you haven't got the capacity to make a good judgment about it. Yeah, thank you. That's true, yes, thank you. Would you like to take any more questions, David? I'm, I'm free. And, and anything else? Is there anything else? So, Anyone else? Do you have anything? There was a, in the chat box. Ah. What was the question? Let me see. Dear sir, Bhagavan's core teaching, Atma Vichara, self inquiry, and Saranagadi, surrender. From years of research of Bhagavan's teaching and also your sadhana, what would be your advice to the seeker? Practice both or either one? Do you see the difference in any? That's the question, David. Can, can you say that again? Sam wasn't good. All right, let me let me, let me do it again. Bhagavan's core, teach, Bhagavan's core teaching, Atma Vichara, self-inquiry, 
and Saranagadi, which is surrender. Oh. Okay, from years of research on Bhagavan's teaching and also your sadhana, referring to your sadhana, David, what would be your advice to a seeker? Practice both or either one. How do you see oh. the difference? How do you see um. the difference? I think even Bhagavan didn't give advice <laughs> on on um, which, which which was better. Uh, you you get you generally had to poke him quite hard to get a resolution to questions like this. Um, he he would normally ask you, well, what what appeals to you? Which practice resonates with you the most? Which is giving you the quietest mind? Which is giving you the most peace? Um, I I think. Although he would say, if you asked him the question, what's the quickest way to attain the self? He would always say self-inquiry, but that doesn't mean that he gave it to everybody who walked into the hall. If, if you asked him, what should I do? He'd generally find out what, what you were doing, um, what practices you've done in the past, what appealed to you. And if you were doing something that you yourself were comfortable with, he'd say, very good, carry on. So... I'm, I'm not going to give fixed advice to random strangers saying me method A is better than method B. I think ba Bhagavan himself would ask a few questions and basically say, if you're happy with this method, follow this method. If you're happy with another method, follow that method. But if you asked him the direct question, what's the quickest, what's the most direct, he'd always say self-inquiry. But that doesn't mean that everybody wants to do it, that everyone can benefit from it. Uh, pe people who wanted to practice surrender were allowed to practice surrender and people who felt good doing a mix of both were also encouraged. So I'm, I'm not going to say that one or the other or a combination is better. It depends on your temperament, your personality, uh, and it's up to you to decide what, what works for you and how well your own practice is going for you. Uh, one of Bhagavan's more famous comments was, go, go to that place where you find peace. And by that, I take that to mean not just a physical guru or a location. It could, it could be the state inside yourself. What gives you the maximum amount of peace? Whatever it is, that's the right practice for you. That's the right teacher for you. That's the right place for you. So you, you determine that by the quantity of peace it gives you. And it's not for someone else to prescribe for you. That was a question from the uh, former vice president. That was Magesan. Uh, yeah, he was our former vice president. All right, now we, we are almost towards the end of the session. Unless somebody has any more question? Anyone? All right. Okay, David, we hope the session with David it definitely would have been an enlightening one. And on behalf of the society and its seeker devotees, we would like to record our gratitude and many, many thanks to David for being with us today. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. Thank you, David. We will meet you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.